trying to kind of share your story with everyone here this evening. Um, so I think I will start by introducing myself and then I will allow the panelists here to introduce themselves as well. Um, to be very honest, I think everyone here, I mean, not the panelists, they are my friends. I think I've met everyone in person, excluding all our early. We've been talking remotely for about six months now. Um, so let me start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Helen, um, Helen Oliemi. Um, I'm a cybersecurity professional. I think uh, I've been in cybersecurity for about seven years now. Yes, yeah, seven years, 6th of December, which was like four days ago. It's clocked seven years. I remember then when I started as a graduate trainee in cybersecurity and seven years, wow. wow. Maybe I'm getting old, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> yeah, and, um, and I think, I've been around the security operations and um, GRC domain. So like my work experience has been like 80% security operations, you know, being a stock analyst, vulnerability management and the likes, and then 20% GRC. And, um, and I think it's been a beautiful journey. I mean, cybersecurity, as we all know, it's like um, a very, should I call it a challenging career? Not, but it's demanding, like in terms of you need to read, you know, keep up to speed and, you know, try to do a lot of things as the threat landscape keeps changing. And so I feel for everyone here, we must be like a guru or like have like a dedication for something or passion for cybersecurity, because it's not just something that you just like wake up and be like, oh, I want to go to office. Sometimes you need to read, you know, juggle like career with personal life and, you know, it's involved a lot of, you know, yeah. So. But um, we are here this evening, so I think the purpose of this, um, should I call it, uh, not meeting, like I'm used to saying meeting, the purpose of this session is just for us to kind of, you know, hear from the panelists' uh, experiences around how they were able to kind of get a job in cybersecurity, especially in the UK, I mean, some kind of switch from um, student visa to work visa, and some got like job directly from Nigeria to the UK. Just want to kind of hear their story, relocation process, how do how were they able to kind of you know meet all these? And um, I have Ebolua here. Um, Ebolua, I think I've known Ebolua now for about two years, and um, we are mama together, and then cyber. I love like cyber mama. Let me put it that way. And I, I would allow Ebola to share a story. And I also have like Bukola here. I think myself and Bukola, we work together as a colleague in the same department in Fidelity Bank about two, three years ago. And um, ever since then, we remain good friend, good colleague, and mama as well. Let me let me that way. And then Precious Silas on the call. I met Precious through Ebu and um, realized that Precious was like a cybersecurity um, manager, you know. And um, it's been one year since I, yeah, been one year with Precious and it's been fantastic. I would say we also like mama together. It's like, it's like a cyber mama session, don't mind me. And then um, last night of Olawale, I think um, I met Olawale during his internship with um, Cyblock. And um, I mean, Olawale has been fantastic. I would, let me just allow them to share their story I mean, I can't really share their story. I mean, let's hear from the horse's mouth. And so um, let's start with Ebolua. Ebolua, um, can you please introduce yourself? And then, uh, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you, Hen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, fab. Thank you for putting together this um, webinar, because um, I always say like, there's nothing better than sharing one's career journey with others who, you know, are definitely looking to um, get into the space, but also because we were once at the point where we needed some direction and somebody provided that direction. So it's my pleasure to be able to share this evening with everyone. So my name is Ebon Lua Oshudi. I'm an information security manager um, for one of the um, price comparison tech companies in the UK. Um, and in, did you want me to say a bit, a bit about my journey or just introduce myself briefly? Yeah, I think you just introduce yourself briefly and then we'll go into that. Okay, Fab. I've been in this space for a little over six, I don't even know if it's seven years, but I'm not counting at this point. Let's just say we're going on with our career. 
Um, and I started in cyber um, from doing, um, I had an undergraduate degree in computer engineering, did a master's in information security in the UK, and then my journey to cyber began. I will save the remaining for when we have to talk about our career journey. That's me. Yeah, thank you. Um, Bukola, as, as I as I have it on my screen, so Bukola, please so introduce yourself. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Bukola, and thank you so much for having me here today. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, just a brief introduction from my end. Um, a senior associate in the Tech Audit Unit. I'm currently working with um, PwC UK. I resumed here in March this year on a skilled worker visa and proud to join in PwC. I started my career in um, the banking sector. I started as a graduate trainee and after spending two and a half years there, I joined Deloitte and then I'm here. So as we dive in deeper, I would like provide further details about how my career journey went. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I'm um, giving the mic to Ola Wale. Um, Ola Wale. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, okay, so <laughs> thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, this particular opportunity to be here. Um, me and you, we, myself, and um, Henny, we, um, I think we just met a few months ago, right? And it's actually been a very interesting, um, um, I mean, connection, right? So it, let me just talk about myself. So um, my name is Olawa Yorale. I have a background in computer engineering. Um, that was my first degree. And I also had um, my master's in social security in the UK, uh, which was just, uh, which I just graduated this year, actually. And um, right now, I work as security operations analyst at um, Xtron, Xtron Limited, uh, UK in Cambridge. And uh, what more? That, that's just me, <laughs> basically, right now. Maybe when we talk about um, more details of our career journey, then I'll be able to um, say some of the things. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lowali. Um, precious. Yeah, thanks, Helen, and hi, everyone. Um, it's really exciting to be here. Um, for me, so again, sir, my name is Precious um, Silas. I've been within the cyber security space um, for the last, I think, six, a little over six years, thereabouts. Um, similar to Ebon Olawali, I also have a background in computer engineering, and then I did a master's in ethical hacking and network security i think that's what it was called and then yeah and then transitioned into like the professional space so yeah that's that's really just the summary of what my background has been like yeah you're speaking on mute helen oh thank you for that i said not to scare us looks like everyone has background in computer engineering and i think even the colors I do in computer science, yeah. Yeah, yeah. However, cyber security is not for people that has like background in computer engineering, computer science, but it's just like fortunate this evening that we, we all had like computer engineering background. So don't worry, even if you have like a background in business or agri or something, that doesn't mean that you can't stick kind of, you know, push your career in cyber security. So um, just kind of want to you know, let us know that, but it's like, we are computer engineers, I mean, definitely cyber security is like, you know, you have to. Okay, so um, now let's talk about career journey. And um, I think I should start with Precious this time around. So Precious, can you maybe share your career journey with us, you know, um, since you start maybe like 2001 or 1998, depending till, you know, how has the journey been and um, how did you get to cyber security? Just kind of maybe share your experience with us. Yeah. My precious, can you hear us? So, yes, I can. I can. My apologies. So, um, yeah, my career journey, I think, like I mentioned earlier, um, 
I've been within the space for a little over six years and um, a large chunk, but if not all of that um, time frame, really has really been within the consulting space. So I've worked um, with two consulting companies um, in the last six years. And I've had, at least I've been fortunate to have a good mix of experience across um, different domains within cybersecurity. So um, I started out with, with um, a bit more technical stuff. So things around penetration testing, vulnerability management, all of those type of work. And then I did a little bit around IT audit as well. And then a little as well around compliance. And I mean, all of these things were really done to um, really identify what area within cybersecurity I really wanted to do. So when I started, I wasn't quite sure where I wanted to focus or how I wanted to, how I wanted my career to go. So it was quite good for me to be able to have a mix of experience across all of the domains. And I mean, fortunately, I was in a, an industry where I had that privilege to experience that. And then um, I've also done a little bit around data privacy. So um, yeah, that has really been, I think high level, um, some of the key things that I have done within the last um, six years in the consulting space. So I'm currently in the place where I'm transitioning into industry and um, with a focus on cybersecurity risk. So um, again, drawing from experiences of some of the things that are done um, around compliance and risk management, those sort of things, um, that experience is quite relevant for me. So uh, that's one thing I, I look forward to continue to build on or hone um, into, as well as expanding more in terms of my experience within the data privacy um, space. So, yeah, in a nutshell, that's that's really what my journey has been. I don't know if there's anything else um, I should have added at this point. Yeah. And, um, I mean, you, you, I mean, I think you've covered everything. To be very honest, and um, so. Now it's looking, I mean, I think I love the data privacy aspect of thing. I mean, so do you think anyone on this call who is interested in becoming like a data governance manager or DPO, data privacy officer, I mean, is that like a career that you, do you think that kind of career is possible? Like, okay, I want to focus on being a DPO or data governance manager. Do you think anyone could chase that career and precious? I mean, looking up from, from your career journey. So oh, um, looks like Precious is um, off the camera. Okay, so I'm going to give the mic to Olawale to share um, his career journey with us. So can you hear me? Oh, okay. Hi, yes, Helen. Helen. Okay. my apologies. But no. can you hear me, though? Can you see yeah. me? Yes, 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 we can. Okay, okay. Yeah. I think if I got the question correctly, it had something to do with um, the point around data privacy rights. Can yeah. someone who is... Um, I would say the answer is yes. Um, in fact, the interesting thing is that your skills around cybersecurity in terms of security practices and controls are very relevant when you go into talking about data privacy because... Um, there's an aspect of data privacy that um, speaks directly to data security. It's one of the key principles when you go into data privacy. So that definitely helps. Um, again, I know that it's, it's very common to see people within the legal profession handling data privacy, but that's really because um, they have the legal and regulatory side, of, a knowledge of legal and regulatory side of things. But one of the key things that you also find that they need, or maybe they would have gotten some level of um, experience with is the technical side, because the reality is that you really can't do privacy without the technology side of things anyway. So that's that's something that's quite important. And if anybody within the on the call um, wants to go into data privacy as an aspect, and I mean, you're just interested in cybersecurity, that's also another area that um, you can focus on. Of course, um, it would join, just take you time to learn what some of the regulations, again, depending on what regulation you're looking at, um, growing your skills on, understanding what those regulations are, but definitely your technology or cybersecurity skills are very relevant, very, very important really within that space. Yeah, yeah, 
Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Precious. Okay, so um, Olawale, um, you have the mic. Um, can you just maybe share your career journey with us? All right, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, my career actually in IT literally started um, since my um, higher institution days where I was typically interested in fixing things. I mean, you know, I had done, done the training back then before I got to school. Uh, we call it desktop publishing and then you know, system engineering. I don't know, I can't, I can't remember system repair and stuff like that. So when I was in school, I, you know, was, I had a side hustle where I would help people to fix their laptops. You know, I would help people to install operating system and all of those kind of things, you know. And um, at some point, worked in a cyber cafe, you know, all of those things, um, was um and and um couple with the fact that i was doing computer engineering you know it helped me to be to be more inquisitive you know to know more about things like um windows operations you know then network engineering at some point and then um you know after school i i um had my ccna training at the time which you know got me my first job as a network engineer. So I started working as a network engineer when I left school, and um, you know, then on that job I, you know, did more you know complex stuff around you know networking technologies, so routing and switching, troubleshooting uh, complex networks and things like that. However, I didn't stay long on that job. I um, got another one as an IT systems engineer and that was where I now you know started doing things more around IT service desk functions you know uh, management of active directory services um, 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 DSCP DNS um, web, web proxy management um, um, you know things like um, email platforms server management and all that and um, you know, interestingly, even though security wasn't wasn't a priority at the time for us in the company where I was working at the time, but um, there was that point where we had a, we had a ransomware attack, and you know there was really no one who had that cyber security experience or that cyber security knowledge. Yeah, even though it wasn't bad. The, our infrastructure wasn't bad, but um, we didn't have that when ready for the attack. So that was about the time when I started having more interest in security. You know, I started learning. I called guys or my friends who were already doing cyber security. I called them, what should we do? What can we do? And all that. And then that was when I started learning things around incident response, you know, vulnerability management, patch management, and you know, it's been quite interesting. And then moving on from there, I um, also um, got another job um, and you know, started doing um, more of network security. So I would, I would typically say that my most of my career has been more around network architecture and um, network security, actually, for um, more over a decade now, actually, if I would say. so. I've done things more around um, firewall management, you know, IDS, IDS, uh, advanced malware protection, um, things like um, network access control. At some point, I managed Cisco IS as identity services engine because I worked with uh, the system integrator at some point and had to deploy all of these solutions for uh, for clients. So um, fast forward, I found myself in in, um, in the UK doing um, master's in cyber security. And when I was doing the master's in cyber security, I decided, okay, so guys, when I'm getting a job in the UK, I'm no longer doing, I'm no longer gonna be doing a typical network security rule. I want a cyber security rule that would allow me to do more around, say, you know, endpoint protection, vulnerability management, patch management, 
and all of those things, then if power management is part of it, then that's fine. Or a bit of um, network architecture, you know, it's still it's still okay because I have the knowledge. And um, so I guess that was um, why I was able to land my current role with um, with my um, with my current employer. And um, interestingly, exactly what I wanted was what happened. Because on my role now, I'm not just doing security operations alone. I also have the um, opportunity to be able to also manage the network, um, um, the architecture, the network architecture to, to a little extent, and which is quite nice. So that's that's more like the um, um, the typical um, career journey for me. Oh. Yeah, uh, that's it. Interesting. I think no, come back to you. I mean, how you were able to kind of, you know, move from I mean, after your master's degree and security job in with a UK company, and I'm sure probably you've kind of switched visa from them to that work visa and still going to ask a question or that. But I mean, it's like Olawale has been technical since since day zero. Um, still wondering. Okay, let me talk now. Um, I think let me give a bolua. Um, a bolua, can you share your career journey with us? Let, let me give you the mic. And then I would um, conclude on that later. Okay, great. Thanks, Helen. So in terms of my career journey into cyber, after I finished my, well, during my master's in, uh, sorry, my undergrad in computer engineering, um, I found out that the courses that intrigued me were like related to cybersecurity and stuff. And then my university kind of like give the option for you to do courses like the CCNA, which was quite nice, but it was the security or the securing things part of it that interested me more than anything. Um, and then when it came to after NYC, I thought, what next? What am I going to do? A master's was on the table for me just because of, of course, Nigeria, where would I get a job that translates, you know, into something that I would enjoy. So master's was the path for me, but before I went on that path to do my master's, um, I checked on LinkedIn and I started looking at people who were working in the space that are Nigerian and I've also done a master's in um, information security or cyber security just to understand is this really viable is it worth it what direction would it go and I remember I had a chat with one of the ladies who had done it in one, one of the universities in UK and she explained to me her journey, how she's doing and how she's enjoying it. And I thought, okay, this is perfect. In addition to that as well, um, my uncle also worked in a cyberspace and it was quite interesting that, um, you know, he had done also a master's in cybersecurity and that also drove me better into considering um, learning a bit more about the space. So went on did the master's, it was all great and fine. Um, and then getting into the job space was the interesting part i won't dwell too much on it because i know helen is going to come back to ask questions around getting a job but got a job into the space um and i spent then over a little over five years in consulting and worked in various domains um from GRC, I spent a large chunk of my time in consulting the security operations space. So leading team of cybersecurity analysts, speaking to the business requirements and, you know, all of that. Before I then transitioned into industry where I'm now mostly focused on um, cybersecurity governance, risk and compliance. Um, and the switch has been quite an interesting one. Once again, I won't steal Ellen's shine for asking the questions, but there's just been no gets along the way that's helped me. But I would say it's majorly been people I've spoken to that have given me direction. I, I enjoy understanding people's journey, the challenges they faced and how they were just able to, you know, navigate. I just wanted to say something about what you said, Ellen, because I know a lot of us speakers here, we had something to do with the technical field yeah. in um, our journey. Um, but just for anyone on the call who is not from a technical field, I want to say that you don't have to do a technical degree or course to work in cyber because I've had loads of colleagues from, you know, the legal background, from, you know, English, from just non computer science related degrees and they were able to transition to cyber security because it's all about understanding the core principles of securing stuff which everybody does in their day-to-day -day life um and also the learning and education on top of it um 
that ends up putting you in a good space for job applications and everything else. So just to assure everyone, cyber is a space for everyone. Yeah, that's yeah. it from me. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ebulua, for that. And to be very honest, I think um, when we're just talking about, you know, researching, when, when you kind of start your, maybe decide on whether you want to do like a degree in master's degree in cyber security. I think that was like, I'm sure maybe 2015, 2016, thereabouts. And I remembered, I studied computer engineering quite all right. And I was, I think I wasn't aware of cyber security, to be very honest. I just wanted to become maybe a programmer or a network engineer. But at the end of the day, I got my first role as a graduate, graduate cyber security engineer. And then when I got the first role, and then I was like, going to tell maybe people about my job. And it's like, oh, well, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm a security person. And you know, in their mind of mind, they thought I was a police officer, you know. And then, you know, you kind of have to kind of explain your job. I mean, kind of give them details around, oh, I'm not a security officer. Um, I'm a security officer in the cyber world, but not in the physical world, that kind of a thing. And I think the first six months, to be very honest, I was not so proud of my job role or job title because i wasn't like a software engineer or a network engineer that kind of thing but you know along the line i realized that you no know, this is a very um you know lucrative career and a very important field yeah so thank you for that so um, bukola um yeah who wants to kind of hear your career um joining okay um where do i start from so i've always been an it person as i said i studied computer science even proud to my undergraduate days i i think i was in ss1 also that i had to go to like a computer institute to study study i started from like desktop publishing so after my secondary school i went back to that school to like be a tutor so i had to like be training people that are doing like starting especially those that that were in GS3 or so. So I started from there and I was able to like understand the basic stuff about computer. So um, I wouldn't know if there's any other course I might have studied if I didn't study any course related to like maybe information technology or computer. So yeah, I studied computer science and I finished my NYSC in March 2019. Then um, I think three to four months before I finished my NYC, I started applying for a job. And fortunately for me, I got um, an offer with Fidelity Bank three months after my NYC and actually found myself in this field, actually, because uh, it was actually a digital training and um, it was at the end of the training school, they had to like give us an offer letter. So it was just like NYSC, maybe after your um, save, after your camp, you open the um, letter and you see where you were posted to. So when I just saw the offer letter, I was, the, yeah, I was actually interested in the money. Then when I glanced through, I saw where I was posted to that under CISO division in information systems control. I was like, where is this place? I have no idea. Yeah, so I didn't know where I would be after my NYSC. I actually just prepared for the labor market because, yeah, my boyfriend then, as that, uh, then he was now my husband, he was two years ahead of me and um, I was able to learn from his mistakes and every other thing. So I was really prepared for the labor market. And I think luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity for me. So I joined Fidelity and I met some interesting colleagues and some of the people we came in together. So um, that was how I find like the um, career interesting with the people that are joining me and those that my senior colleagues those that I was looking up to. So after spending two and a half years there, I started like looking for another um, place because, oh, sorry, my daughter is crying. No. So you know, we are all cyber mamas and cyber dada on the call. So. <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean, before because yeah. I'm, so sorry about that. Sorry, it's not fine. <laughs> Yeah, I've actually sorted that for two two hours. I didn't know <laughs> what happened. Yeah, so um, I started applying, and fortunately for me, I got three offers. 
I got one in um, two banking sector and I got one in um, Deloitte. So I remember then I was calling my people. I, I, Ellen was part of those I called because Ellen was my senior colleague also. So I called, I called every other person. Okay, I got this offer, one in UBA, one in Providence and one in Deloitte. Like they wouldn't even listen to me. They would just say Deloitte. I was like, what's happening? You didn't even ask the pay. You didn't even ask what's really happening. So every people that was just like calling them. So I think I, I, I was like, okay, let me go with this Deloitte and I learned that the career goes and every other thing. I, I, that, that was how I met myself in the consultants um, field in the Wix advisory unit. So um, I think I spent a year and a month in Deloitte. So it was actually a fast one. I didn't really expect it because um, when I was in Deloitte, um, most of my seniors, they were just like dropping resignation letter and every other thing like that. I was surprised to the extent that the next day we will be looking forward to the next person that would drop the letter. And that was really happening. So I met one of them and um, she gave me a CV, explained one or two things to do and everything. So that was what I did. And I just said, let me try my luck. I did. And after a month, I got two offers here in the UK. And yeah, I had to choose. <laughs> one and yeah it was actually like too fast or I, I didn't know how to put it yeah so yeah i am everything is good except the weather <laughs> yeah, i mean I, I remembered when Jicola, um reached out i mean when she got three of us i mean two banking industry and consulting and um yeah to be very honest i think i remember that i also did not kind of ask for salary or talk about pay but i was like oh deloitte that's your gateway into uk like consulting, I mean, just the one year, then you know, maybe a plan that you get like a UK offer, like consulting, is maybe, maybe is that I might be wrong, but yeah. And then, because when you said, okay, maybe if you were not doing cyber security, I think for me to be very honest, I did not choose to study computer engineering in the university. Oh. I guess, should I call it like a luck or fit? I don't know. I, I know that I have flair for mathematical or technical concepts in secondary school however i i think the best career then in nigeria was to be a nurse or a doctor and I, so i think i chose nursing as my first choice of course and um drum roll i was given computer science and engineering in lautech and i was like oh and i thought i was going to switch after my first year because then in my university you can actually switch after your first year to course of your choice and during that time they actually did not allow us to switch like okay you can't go to medical school you can actually go to maybe other department but you can't go to medical school medical school and boom computer engineering it is and you know that was how i kind of find myself in computer engineering to be very honest maybe i would have become like nurse ellen today and i would call myself nurse mama nurse cyber mama you know but that by the way okay so um i might just start with bukola right and like i would say i mean we've kind of switched from banking sector to consulting in nigeria and then from consulting in nigeria to getting two offers in the uk as well like into two consulting firm in the uk i'm sure that you must have faced some kind of maybe interesting challenges or something so I my question would be like what was your biggest like challenge i mean when you're trying to kind of secure like a cyber security role in the UK. I mean, at the end of the day, you got two all offers that kind of that are ready to sponsor you, right? But what was the biggest challenge when you're trying to, I mean, while applying an interview? Can you just like you know share that with us? And how did you overcome it? Okay, um, like I said earlier, um getting a job from Deloitte to PwC UK yeah, is actually like something I didn't really expect. It was actually a smooth one, to be honest. Um, and it's because, probably because um, when recruiters, like, like I work with a globally recognized firm and when recruiters see that in your CV, they will need to do more search on Google on the company you were actually working for to be able to acknowledge um, exactly if you're able to do a good work, right? So with that, I think the CV stage is like, past so um and i said um, earlier again that i met one of my senior that actually dropped like a resignation letter to 
asked her how she went about it. So with that, she was able to give me a CV. So I think there is like a format or something like that that you use and this. So having someone that is able to like give me what she actually actually used right actually like another check for me that made it like smooth for me so i just like tailored my cv to what i have and i think that was like checked also and applying to other big fours when i'm already in one is actually another checks so um during the interview i actually applied for um the same role as at what i was doing in deloitte so i think there are a lot of things that actually like I checked and was like really smooth for me. And I think I didn't really face a lot of challenges. So what that I just realized was that when I was applying, I applied for, was it almost 24 applications within the space of one month? Yes, I applied for 24 and I got the first interview. Um, I, I didn't do it well. The yeah, I think the, I remember the equator was asking me a lot of like is I was really prepared for the technical aspect of the interview because I know that okay, I, I know what I'm doing here and this is the same role I'm apl applying for and everything, but it didn't end in only the like technical aspects. So they were just asking different questions, even she even asked like um why UK. So I was explained, I was there, okay, yes, okay, I need to like maybe improve, like just, <laughs> I was just saying a lot of things. I need this experience as an international something. I, I was just saying a lot of things, but I think it needed one key point or something. Was I knew, I think, I, I wouldn't know. So it was, it was like, no, I won't be able to look progress further because you didn't, you are not really sure of why you want to like come to UK. I was like, with all these things I've explained that, okay, why? I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, I started like like finding um, a right answer to that. Uh, so they were like, just um, leave the person is not serious. I think what you said was actually fine, blah, blah, blah. So I think that was a challenge because it actually drew me back that, is it like, I didn't really know why I want to like come to UK or this person is not really interested in me. So I kept on applying and fortunately for me, I, I saw uh, um, another in, um, interview. I was really prepared. I didn't really prepare for only the technical now, so I prepared for anything that would like that might come my way. And I think I I did well. And the next week I had another one with KPMG, and I think that was also fine. So then the offer came at the same time, and yeah, that was. Yeah. So I I think there was no more challenges except. Another issue of maybe if Nigeria wants to come your way, maybe you have an interview, the generator would stop working. You are, I know you are really like find, trying to find the way around on how you are going to like do this or yeah. So I think aside my village people, I don't think there's any, <laughs> any major issue, yeah. Yeah, uh, just kind of want to confirm, you said you applied to 20, so 24 different organizations yeah. were they all consulting or consulting and the product-led company they were all audit firm i applied deloitte kpmg pwc ey grant 13 and bdo yes yeah. i think they were much as that when i was applying it was actually a busy season for them they really needed a lot so there was a lot of like um um a lot of things on the career side that i needed to apply for like it's not even only like in london or in manchester or this so i applied for different locations in the uk mm. yeah so oh. i think on the career side you can see maybe let's say like it audits and you would see like seven different it audits on that career it, it, it actually depends on the location and everything so i applied oh. for different locations across okay. yeah then I remember, I think you told me something around peak period of recruitment. I don't know if that is still the same. I mean, I think you said like, oh, they normally kind of maybe recruit in September. Can yeah. you clarify that? So, so in big force, we actually have like busy season. Even in Nigeria, like I said earlier, that there was at some, a time we were actually looking forward to the next person that would drop resignation letter <laughs> as at then, because um, it was really a busy season. I think it's around my orgasm are here, so I don't know if I'm actually right. So it's around maybe late um around September, October, November to like early next day, like January, February. 
Yeah, so within that, it's actually a peak period for them and we really needed a lot of people to come and especially experienced people yeah in the London. so it actually applies across the other big fours yeah. and yeah since it was actually the time they really needed a lot of people so it was i was fortunate to apply during that period and yeah i think it was one of the um, things that made it easy for me also okay thank you so i think before i go to everyone olawale i think precious would like my want to kind of share a story because um, I think Bukola and Precious, they were both in like consulting firm and then they moved from Nigeria to the UK you know, to another consulting firm. So Precious, I mean, you have the floor and maybe just want me to confirm one or two things that Bukola said or you know, just tell us your career journey and how you kind of secure your role in the UK. No, not career journey, the challenge you face, you know, securing a role in the UK. And um, maybe you also apply to like 50 or 500 jobs. <laughs> just one year, please I'd like to hear you. Okay, so um, for me, I think I'll just backtrack a little bit um, before I then go into how I moved from Nigeria to the UK. Um, one of the major challenges I had at the beginning, so I mentioned when I was talking about my journey, um, the fact that I had done a master's in um, ethical hacking and network security, that was done in the UK here. And um, at that point, after I had done my um, master's, of course, the next thing was to then start looking for jobs. And again, um, so one of the key issues I had was, first of all, finding, so first things first, I did not start looking for a job early on because again, I was just in that place where I wasn't sure what, what field of cybersecurity I wanted to go into. And I mean, there might be someone else on the call who is just like me and is just wondering like there's so many areas in cyber security what exactly should i even be doing so um it took me a while to do a bit of research to even understand while i had done a master's in that area we had focused a lot on the very technical things and i mean i was also looking at my career plan long term so do i really want to stay technical from start to finish do i want to have a variation of governance and all of those things so i had to navigate that particular season and then i moved into applying but unfortunately again because the student visa and it's limited i didn't start on time so um a lot of the um applications i had put in was always already one from one rejection to the other so i had my own fair share of all of those rejections um one of the ones where i had had a lead so it seemed like things were transitioning unfortunately the process was then slowed down and of course, I had to go back to Nigeria. So, yeah, I went back to Nigeria and worked in consulting for about five years before leaving and um, transitioning into the UK. Again, because very similar to what Bukola had said, um, because I was leaving consulting into another consulting company, I mean, it was very similar in terms of what the job role um, was going to be like. So, um, the it wasn't too difficult to navigate. Um, unlike the color so i didn't have to apply to too many roles and i think i probably just applied to two roles or something and i just picked the first one that came i didn't wait for the second one so um it was i didn't have challenges per se with that because i was living i was going within the same industry again you might be moving from it doesn't have to be consulting you might be moving from any other sector to a completely different sector within um the UK or anywhere else that you're going to, I think one of the key things there is uh, making sure that you know what area of cybersecurity you want to focus on. You're targeting the companies that you want to focus on. Um, you are also building your skills, making yourself relevant for those particular roles that you want to occupy. Um, you're speaking to the right people. Um, again, I mean, of course, coming to webinars like this, where you're also learning from other people's experiences, those are some of the things that if I could do anything differently with the first experience I talked about after my master's, these were the things that I should have done. Um, if I had had a little bit of clarity at that point in time, I had known that very similar again to what Bukola had said about recruitment periods especially for graduate roles so if you're in the uk on a student visa for example i know that um companies usually have that recruitment windows and um, window that i think it's until may thereabouts or april i don't remember what it is now but after that period they will tell you oh sorry they finished recruiting for the next year so if you haven't even recruit if you haven't even put in your application by say january february of a particular year you 
you're almost sure that you you may not get in for that particular you have to wait for the next year and all of that yeah so those are some of the issues and challenges i had and then of course there's also the question of finding companies that um are able to sponsor your visa which is the first thing it, I mean, regardless of where you're going to consulting or not, um, you need to ensure that you're not just shooting applications into random companies. They have to be companies that are able to um, sponsor your visa and have the right qualification and all of that. So yeah, um, that was one key challenge for me. And um, I just had to learn from it and then moved on. When it was then time for me to um, apply to come into the UK this time around, um, I ensured that as much as possible, um, I'd done a bit of research. I was kind of sure what I wanted to do at that point, because again, I then had five years of experience um, to leverage on. I had done, just like I'd mentioned, a little bit around different areas within cybersecurity. So it was kind of clear to me where I wanted to be and what I wanted to be doing um, within that space. Um, yeah, so that's, that's really what it is for me. No, thank you. I mean, thank you for that. And um, so, going to going into to Ebolua, I think Ebolua you you switch from tier four to tier two. And I think it was also consulting first, then before you moved to a product led company. I mean, how were you able to kind of secure secure like a work visa or switch from tier four to tier two? Do you think if you had not maybe gotten like an offer with a consulting firm, you would have still be able to get a sponsorship in a in an industry that is not consulting. Just kind of maybe share that with us and I mean the challenge they face. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Helene. Um so challenge I faced tying on to what Precious said, right? During the master season, it was the you you have to have put in your application by in fact by January at least. <laughs> if you're doing the masters it had to be as soon as you're coming in while you're still trying to understand the weather the uk system you need to be applying immediately from september october and november by december things are already closing let's talk about january and i caught on to that very late um because my impressions were doing our masters during that time we used to share notes and we discovered ah it looks like we missed the boat but we say let's just still apply and i remember applying to so many um thinking oh you know the masters in cyber security should open the door right and then i realized not exactly uk experience is not there and sponsorship is another criteria as well um so i submitted loads of applications like countless applications um called loads of rejection but of course after you've talked about the rejection we get up again is he who he who lives to fight another day so you keep applying 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 and it just so happened that one of the applications that i put in um at january for one of the companies um i'd already gotten a rejection later and it just so happened that six months later i got a call and was reinvited into the recruitment process which is very surprising to me and that was how i got my first entry into consulting um i know you asked the question would i have gotten a job in another space i don't know but all i know is god opened that door and i entered into the one that was open um and started my career as a as a security analyst in consulting and i would say it was really one of the best experiences but if for example somebody else gets a job in product later in industry i'll say any opportunity is an opportunity seize it get in get that uk experience itself that is the door opener and every other thing will begin to align and open up there on from there yeah so that was how the switch was also i remember that time as well um there was the trying to understand which company sponsors which company doesn't sponsor i know the uk has a um list of companies who provide tier two sponsorships so that's one way to check but also it's still worth applying and having a conversation with the recruiter when they give you a call if you get to that next phase just to understand or if you even want to know because most roles if they're advertised on linkedin would sometimes have the name of the recruiter recruiting for the role you can always email to ask that oh i just want to understand is this role also open you know to known uk citizens um and all of that just to get an understanding because really clarity is the best if it's not open to you it's better for you spending your time applying and targeting companies who really have that sponsorship open if that makes sense and sometimes 
it might be worth just applying and seeing because after they've had a chat with you and you're so great, the favor of God goes with you. They're like, you know what? We will take you. You just need to explain the process for visa sponsorship to us and we would take you through that process. That also happens. So I'll say there's no one path or one size fits all. There's just different angles. Yeah. Okay. So, and everyone, I understand that you've kind of you know, moved from consulting to a product led. Um, the industry how easy was that for you like imagine you don't have like a, I mean, you've been a consultant for like five six years yeah. how easy was the switch for you i mean would you say it's easy or would you say i mean what are the challenges you kind of face in, okay. in um i would say in terms of the transition i mean nothing is ever easy um of course i face challenges along the way i think consulting has its own perks and what it's like consulting it's more depending on the kind of consulting company it's global they have initiatives you know the culture and their brand is so strong around keeping strong on those initiatives as well um product companies would have that as well um however you would then realize that working in a company which is a big consulting where everything is mechanized and the wheel just keeps rolling it might be a bit different in a product-led company as well um but in terms of challenges to be very honest i wouldn't say i've faced great challenges in terms of the work that i'm doing because cyber security cyber security however the difference is the consulting where you finish off a project you wrap up you're moving on to the next thing in a product like company, you're actually staying with it to see it through. You know, you, if you're talking to somebody about a risk, you're there while they're treating and remediating the risk. When the cycle is done and they haven't fixed it, you're still speaking to them versus consulting where it's hey ho bye. <laughs> so there is that elongation of, you know, your credibility is on the line. You know, everything you say and you do it stands for because they're just a pingy way. They will ping you and ask you what next about what next needs to be done. So I'd say it's just adjusting to that. I wouldn't say it's a big challenge because it's, you know, how the industry works. Also, the other thing I noticed was we consulting whereby you just need to go on to deliver the work that needs to be done. With a product-led company, you really need to understand that what drives the vision and mission of the company, your cyber role in consulting, where a cyber role is, it's the work that's won. You go on to do the job in a product-led company is the you're supporting the business you're an underlying security function so it comes into where it's like oh you know when you come into a company who's contracted you you're held in high regard and whatever in a product-led company you're like everybody else <laughs> in fact you're not even like anybody else you're almost like tech support <laughs> because you're you're supporting the business you know to drive their objectives so it's just a totally different angle, I would say. No. That would be at that. Okay. Thank you for that. And I think then I would go to Olawali. Olawali, I think for you, you um switched from tier four to tier two just like Evan did. But Evan switched, I mean, Evan started with like a consulting organization. I think Olawali, you you're currently working in an industry, like a product-led um industry how i mean how did you or how like a, how was the journey like for you to switch from tier four to tier two i mean what challenges do you kind of face i think because i'm still coming back to you. you said you did one or two things you know one or two things i just met or something to get the role i think i want to understand i want people here to hear that one or two things right but i think for lawali can you just kind of maybe share your experience with us like how how easy was it for you to switch from tier four to tier two? What did you do differently? You know, yeah, um, hello, Ali. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, I think I would say that um, first, what Evan Lua said the other time about um, having a security master in the UK doesn't actually give you the license to get a job. It's, it's totally on point, 100%. When I finished my master's, I started applying for jobs. Interestingly, mm -hmm. I was getting rejection, rejection emails. I, at some point, I would apply. I think at some point, there was a day I counted all the applications I did that day, and I did up to about 30 applications that particular day. And over time, I would 
keep getting, I just kept, kept on getting um, um, rejection emails. And I'm, and I'm like, okay, so what's, what's going on? It's not, <laughs> it's not like I, I don't have enough experience to get the job. But what exactly is happening? Okay, so, um, you know, I started reaching out to people, what's, please, please help me. What, what exactly can I do? What can I do better? Um, I'm, get, I'm seeing this, I'm having this experience. And then, um, um, I think someone told me that I should first forget about the fact that I did a master's in cybersecurity in the UK. There is one thing that UK employers want to see is that do you have a UK experience? Hmm. And that okay, wait. How am I going to have a UK experience when I just finished school? But I have the experience they need for me to do the job. So what are they looking for exactly? Okay, so now a lot of conversation with people here and there. And then um I've been part of um Side Black um at the time. Um I mean Black community. And then a friend of mine who we were in school together, um, he came in September, I came in January. So at some point we had an overlap of our um, of our session. So he did um side black internship and um, it was a very good experience. It was a very good, very fantastic experience for me. Um, and then I was also interested because the, the modules that were you know treated in the internship and you know, all of the learning experience was was quite fantastic, and then I also enrolled on on the um, on the um, internship. All right. Now, another thing also, in addition to that, was that some webinars that I also um, was on to, like um, job related webinars, security related webinars. I heard someone say on. The, uh, on the webinar that when you're looking for a job, um, you need to make sure that you're not applying for the same job with the same CV you've been using. I mean, you're applying for a different job and the same CV you used for the last job, you apply for is the same one you're using for the next one. I mean, try and tailor your CV to the particular role look out for what are the job descriptions on this particular um, uh, job advert, and then try and model that on your CV to make sure that what they're asking for exactly is what you have in your CV. All right, so these two things, I put that together. So I had side back in mind to use as my um, work experience in the UK okay. at, as, I mean, for the internship. And then also for the CV part, I started remodeling my CV, um, you know, alongside with, I mean, in relation to the particular job I'm applying for. So what I noticed was um, maybe over two months period, I now realized that all of the different jobs I've been applying for that I've been getting and um, rejections, over time, I started getting responses. So I get, when I started getting responses, I mean, some would not even respond at all, right? But when I started getting responses, I, I knew something had already started working. Even though I've not gotten a job yet, even though I've not even gotten, um, gotten an interview invite yet. But I knew at least now, I'm, I'm not getting responses. Then I asked them questions. Okay, fine. Something is working. Then you know, later on, I did several internship, I finished, I pushed that onto my, um, onto my profile, you know, put a lot of things I did. And then before I knew it, um, I started getting more, um, more responses from, um, from employers. Then I got the interview invite. Uh, I mean, I think I did just about three, three interviews. And um, and um, the the job that I have right now is more like the one that I knew that okay, I did the first one, did the second one, and then also called for was called for the third one, and I okay, I think this is the job that God has given to me. I think basically, um, 
those are the typical challenges I had at the time. So um, talking about um, talking about how I got a sponsorship. So when employers call me for an interview, or when they, when they reach out to me for a particular job um, opportunity, I tell them that right now I just finished my uh, master's in, in in cybersecurity and I'm currently on on student visa, and I would love to get a sponsorship. Now, I didn't have a pressure. I I I didn't have the pressure to get the sponsorship before having a job. I mean, how do I put it now? There was no pressure to make sure that the job I'm going to get must come with sponsorship. Because I knew that at least with my student visa, I can do um, postgraduate, right? I can do that for two years and then along the line, I can then get a job that can sponsor me. At the same time, my wife also works and we're also hoping that at her place of work, we'll be able to get, um, we'll be able to get sponsorship as well. So I didn't make it seem like um, it was something that must happen. So when they talk to me, I just say, okay, well, it's fine. If you can sponsor, that's all right. That would be very, very fantastic. It's what I want. So God will just as God will just have it. This particular job I have, because I asked them, can you sponsor? They said, yes, if you can sponsor, that's all right. There's no problem. So we had the interviews and then, um, they just gave me, they just told me, okay, we're going to sponsor you, and that's it, basically. I mean, I could say that it's actually God who did it anyways. It's not me because, um, I, I, I don't know, but that was just it basically for me. There wasn't anything I did especially. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean to be sincere, I mean, there is always a God factor. I mean, yeah. There is yeah. Go Sorry, Elena, I think I need I nope. need to add one or two things that really helped yeah. me also. Yes, yeah. yeah. So um, when I was starting out in this industry, right, I noted that um, certifications are more important than degrees, right? Because it's yeah. So um, I really invested in myself in certification. My case is just. Um, the case of like someone that they are not like um, chasing that is actually holding. I, I, I never like stopped <laughs> because uh, we actually 13 that came in together in um, Fidelity Bank there when we were just starting out and 13 of us, some are in vulnerability management, some are in security engineers, some are in different fields. We have a group chat that we really like, we do like, it's just like competitions in terms of like certifications because Fidelity will actually pay back. So we do a lot of certification and that is uh, that actually like helped help me. And the fact that I, I have like 12 other people in the same um, in the same circle that we are just starting out and they actually like really motivate me to be able to do more. So I would say it really helped me even moving from um, the banking sector to Deloitte because with um, everything in my CV then, the certification and everything, even the manager was like, are you able to do all this, right? So I think that was one of the things that helped me. And um, I spent like eight, nine months in Deloitte and I, um, I did my CV and applied to all year. And I remember one of my colleagues was saying at the recruiter called and was like, I'm sorry, unfortunately, we needed someone that have sister. And if which sister, I have it. Let me. So I think I've already like, <laughs> I've already like, like, um, I was already uh, ready for for what is like actually coming. So I remember when I called Ellen. I was like, okay, I have these two offers. Let's look at it and tell me blah blah blah. So like, because I have what you were actually saying right now, because. I see you invested in yourself. I see how much work you've done. Despite like being a wife along the line, I know how you started, I know everything. So she was really proud of me. And I will say that one of the things that helped me was that I think I was really prepared for something that I didn't even know that I would need in the future. So yeah, it was one of the things that actually helped me. Mm. Sorry, um, Hebu, before you talk, I want to ask you something, Kola. During the application process, 
do you have to kind of change your LinkedIn location from Nigeria to UK? Or on your CV, did you just put like Deloitte Nigeria or Deloitte or Deloitte without a location? I'm just kind of, I know that Deloitte is like a, an inter international company like B Force, but do you think that would have kind of have like effects on you know getting like a callback from recruiter? Did you change any of the locations to UK or did they also kind of call you or your Nigeria line or do you have like a UK line? You know, for folks in Nigeria that kind of want to maybe get a job directly from Nigeria, I just want to maybe understand that. Yeah, for me, I didn't I didn't change anything in my CV, in my um, LinkedIn as per location because um, all these bigs for sponsoring is not really hard for them. It's some it's not like a big deal for them, so it's not like something that I would now need to like change my location and later tell them, oh, I'm in two. So, so having um, Deloitte, like I said, it's actually like the key opener for me, right? So they would just say, okay, where are you from? Are you ready to relocate and everything? So it's not a challenge. And um, yeah, I didn't really do different manipulations or anything. I was being straightforward and yeah, they and know that you need sponsors, right? Oh, oh. since you are moving from Delaware, yeah. And so they called your Nigerian line, like? They your... called, yeah. They called my Nigerian. So any number that I would see, like, plus four, four or something, I know that they are my people. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so, Ebolu, I think you raised your so let me allow you to talk. Please. Yeah, so I was going to say, I picked up some things from what Bukola was saying, which I had in mind to share when I was preparing for this call was one around um, never searching alone. And there's actually, my husband told me about this book, actually, there's a whole community movement called Never Search Alone. There's even a book around it, they put you in a program and all of that. But the whole concept of never search alone, really, we already even do it. A lot of us do it, which is searching in community. So when you're going through that job search phase, it's very isolating doing it alone and not be able to speak to somebody about the challenge, somebody to encourage you, like Olawali said, somebody to say, ah, what am I doing wrong? What do I need to change? right um so even if you can and community it forms itself in different ways it can be peer-to-peer -peer community somebody else who is in the space who you know already has what you want or who is searching along with you um it could also be from mentorship even if you're not able to get mentorship from somebody if that your peer already has a mentor they would already be passing on the notes they've gotten from their mentorship to you so it all goes in through that way. There's also various ways from um, communities such as churches, place of worship, friends, area you live. Like there's just so many ways to grow community that could extend to you. Um, there's also LinkedIn as well. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to mention that book. The point about certification, what Bukala said, I really agree about certifications being well placed and the value of it. The one thing I wanted to add on is it's good to be very strategic with what certification you take. There is no point taking every certification under the sun, doing CISSP, um, then going to go and do penetration testing and doing this one. And the certifications don't tie into your on the day job. You know, it, it just works in the reverse for somebody who does that. So I would say on the certification line, get a certification, but make sure that it's in line with something you have experience with so that you are able to support that certificate. It has better weight um, in that sense. So yeah, that's what I wanted to share. Oh, and one more thing was around CVs. You asked about location and stuff on the CV. So yeah. more around tailoring your CV to because coming from Nigeria, right? The Nigeria CV standard is like people still put their 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 address, you know, their their gender, their, like some other personal details that in the UK sense is not required. Also, some ways in which you will write your Nigerian CV, it's not what is required in the UK sense. So this is where being in community comes into place. If you have a peer or a mentor or some sort of community like Cyblack or whatever, where they're like, oh, this is a sample UK template, you're able to then tailor your experience, make your experience sound very results driven, you know, remove all those personal details about your location and whatever, you know, and making your CV very strategic and pointed. Um, yeah, that's what when it's add yeah thank you when i think to be very honest i think i remembered when i moved to the uk three years ago yeah because, yeah i was in london however i think one i think this would be for people in the uk maybe say for you're trying to 
maybe get a job in cyber security sponsorship or none. I think, like Kevin said, you don't need to put your address. I mean, on my CV, I just put United Kingdom. I did not bother, bother to put maybe London or Edinburgh or those kind of things. And that way, you are flexible to kind of apply to, I mean, depending on your choice, you might want to kind of relocate to Edinburgh or Newcastle or whatsoever. But because you have the United Kingdom on your CV, leave that to the recruiters who ask you if you are willing to relocate to maybe Wales or, you know, that kind of a thing. But I think you can just leave it as United Kingdom rather than put in a particular location. I think that is like a, a very um, key important thing. And now you've kind of, so let me kind of add one thing. I mean, what Olawale said about never use one CV for the same role. I think that is actually really important because I think cyber security is so wide that sometimes they call you a security analyst and on the job description, you're more of a, an engineer than a security analyst. And so imagine you having like a, a SOC or monitoring related JD on your CV, applying for something that looks like a security engineering role, but you know that you can actually do this, that might not actually really work in, in terms of you know, getting called back for an interview. So we need to kind of tailor our CV based on what they are, I mean, the, the, the organization is actually looking for. But one key thing is, don't copy verbatim like because they said they need a b c d and e then on your cv you quickly go and edit it to a b c d and e i think that would not make sense you might still have like a b c d and e however in in a restructured restructured or refined way right just kind of you know they still kind of read the same mini but it's not like word for word so i think that is actually really important when you're trying to edit your cv and so i think i would ask precious this question Pressures when you got, I mean, a job with, I don't know, I think Deloitte or something. I mean, when you move to the UK on a tier two visa, um, in terms of costs, right? I mean, did you kind of have to like maybe, maybe like save up or is everything kind of covered by the organization? How is this being done? Do they give you everything for free, could the visa fee and IHS fee or? I mean, I never know. So you can actually be share your experience with us on that and people can know like maybe they need to start preparing for like save up to a certain amount of money in, in the pounds rate and, and the like. So if you want to kind of share that with us, um, precious. Okay, so um, I'll speak based on obviously the job that had brought me into the UK, but um, like I mentioned, I've also transitioned away from that as well. So um, I would also just speak to all of that. Um, I think really it depends on the role that you're being recruited for. So a lot of the packages that come, um, they vary per the type of role and then they also be vary based on the organization as well. So um, for me, when I moved from Nigeria, um, based on the contract, the kind of contract that I had, um, the company was willing to pay up for um, my visa fee, my IHS, and I think even the immigration, um, there's something it's called the tuberculosis test, I think, yeah, um, that we had to do prior to applying for visa, they also covered that cost, but then you needed to pay for it upfront. So definitely you have to save up your money, have your money to pay for everything. And then when you resume the job, you can then claim back um, that particular expense. Um, I've also heard of companies where they would provide so they would make all the payments for you and then you pay back in installments so they take i think a fraction of the amount over a period of time so for example they spent three thousand pounds to bring you for um for instance they then take maybe 500 pounds for the next six months to make up um so yeah that's 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 another option that happens and then there are also companies where um they would pay everything up front and then you are then there's then a clawback contract um, clause rather within your contract to say if you leave us within a particular time. So if you leave us within one year or two years, you pay back the entire money. But if you stay with us for as much as maybe two, three years, depending on the kind of rule that you're getting, um, then you're not bound to pay back anything. So for the first job I did, 
I think there was a one year clause there, if I'm not mistaken. While I had to pay for everything up front, I was able to reclaim the expense. But then I had a clause that said, if you leave within the first year, then you're going to pay a fraction back. So that's something that, I mean, of course, you need to pay attention to your contract. There are also some companies that will say, um, the only thing we're going to pay for is for your um, the sponsorship itself. That's the COS itself. That's the only thing they would pay for. And then you're 100% responsible for. I mean, there's no there are no rules to these things. And even with um, the company that I came in with, I think there were also a few other people that their visa fees were in space. So it depends on the role, the level that you're coming in um, with, the type of company, and then, yeah, all of those things. So it's best to ask those questions as, so of course, maybe not at the very beginning, because that's not what you really want to be budging your head with. You want to focus on getting the role, and then as um, you progress within the stage, you then try to understand what are the implications, are you required to make payment and all of that. But I think just as a safety net for yourself, it's good to also just save up just in case um, you're in a position where you need to pay up front or um, you need to, the company needs to pay or whatever it is really, just have some level of safety net and then you, you're able to hedge um, whichever way they come and say, oh, we're going to make the payment for you up front. I mean, that's very good for you. At least you still have your savings. So yeah, that's that's what my experience was. Mm. Okay, um, thank you. So I think this is not part of yeah, but I was going to just ask I mean, anyone, probably Ebun or Lawali. For instance, I'm I'm like one year into cybersecurity. I'm based in Nigeria. Do you think, yeah, there is God factor. Do you think if I kind of want to apply for a role in the UK, should I? look out for a junior role or a mid revel or should i wait and get more experience in nigeria before you know trying this out i mean what would you advise because i have one year experience in cyber security and i really want to relocate to the uk on a tier two visa or would you say maybe if i have the phone i should consider master's degree do you think master's degree really kind of help in all this, I mean, job securing, I mean, securing a job in the UK. I mean, what would you say? It's just, um, what what would you think? Herbun, Precious, or Lawa Libukola, who would like to go first? Okay, so if I would go first with this one. Um, so I think to answer the question, one of the questions you asked directly, um, do you have to get a master's degree? The answer is no, to be honest. Um, yes, a couple of us, I think three of us on the on the call, we we had we got master's degrees um related to cybersecurity, but I also know a lot of people that have transitioned into cybersecurity without master's degrees, without a background in computer engineering, computer science, whatever. So um you don't have to do that. However, um for me, while it is important or while it's um possible rather for you to get a job with your one year experience again one year is quite it depends on what you're doing in that one year in that space of one year you could have worked for one year but by the time um, you look at the variation of experiences that you have it could be equivalent to someone else's three four five years right it, it all depends on how you're able to communicate all that you have done within that one year in your cv and that's really so because, I mean, at the end of the day, your CV is what is selling you. So it's how you're able to communicate. If you're able to find a role that suits at the level where it suits what you have done, you're able to say, oh, this is something I can do, or this is something I've, I have experience in, and it's something that you're, you're willing to pursue. Why not? Um, the fact that you have one year experience. I know that there's some organizations that would say, oh, you must have maybe two years, three years and the like. But if an organization is not restricting in terms of saying they will not consider someone who has one year, for instance, then I mean, by all means. However, if someone is just starting out in Nigeria, for example, it's okay to build your skills. I think it's easier to deepen some of the skills that you already have because um, as much as we don't like to talk about it a lot, I think that there are a lot of experience, um, opportunities to broaden and deepen skills within the Nigerian market. Um, a number of things are slightly different in terms of the technologies that um, companies use in the UK and all of that, but the fundamentals are the same. So if you're talking about patch and vulnerability management, the underlying principles are the same. And 
chances are that you have bigger opportunities to deepen those skills, to be exposed to those things um, in Nigeria than you might have here. So here, it might take you a while to be exposed to certain things based on the level. But in Nigeria, because a lot of the teams are way smaller, you're given opportunities that maybe ordinarily you may not have had the opportunity to do. So if I use myself, for example, while I was working in Nigeria, a couple of things I was doing were not really things that were meant for my level. But because first things first, it was a small team, um, there were always opportunities to volunteer to say, oh, can I help with this thing? I'm able to take on this project, all of those things. Those are places where you build skills. So a lot of the things that I would even say helped me really land the job that I'm moving into are not really things that were directly tied to what my job role was. It, they were really things that maybe someone had said, oh, help me with this thing. Again, it was just that finding ways to build skills outside of your regular nine to five um, contract based description, if that makes sense. So I would, my advice would be find opportunities to deepen your skills. You find that when you even deepen your skills, you're able to bargain for higher roles, higher levels. So good example would be when I was moving from Nigeria to the UK, the role I applied for, the role I interviewed for was not the role I was given. In fact, I thought it was a mistake. When I got the offer and the contract, I'm like, mm, this is not what I interviewed for. I was given a higher role. To be honest, I can't explain it. I don't know. I can only say God was the one that did it. But the point is, um, again, like I said, taking advantage of those little assignments or tasks that were given within our organization and just using some of those things, leverage, using those things as learning points, building on your network and all of those things are the things that would then help when you're then looking for um, an opportunity or a job within the UK market, because obviously it's a much more, com organizations are much more complex than they are um, within the Nigerian setting and all of that. So yeah, I think, that would be my two cents on on this question. Um, thank you. Would any of the panelists like to contribute to this? Okay. Yeah. So I think um, I have something to add towards um, question sir, because I right. remember um, I said I got two of us. So the one um, I got with um, EPMG, I remember they like gave me a lower grade, not really low, but it wasn't what I was expecting. So when I had a chat with the recruiter, it was like, um, you have just, you have less than two years experience in the consulting. I said, what? So um, the back in sector, I started my career, I spent to an area. So are you not counting that? So one thing I want us to like pick here is that if you have opportunity to work with any multinational company, please do so. Yeah, because for the recruiter not to recognize a whole, I was like, it's one of the top tier banks in, in my country. And yeah, I it was like, no. So they had to like add it to the, um, what's it called, the offer they were giving me. But it's still the same like grid. I said, no, I'm not getting this. Despite having like the CISA and everything, he said, no, they can't do it. So I think that was one of the reasons I didn't go for that. And so if you have opportunity to work with a multinational company, please do so, yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. So I think, I think in essence, from what Bukola and Pressure say is, is, I think it depends on what you want, right? So for a mid-level cybersecurity professional in Nigeria, who you know, maybe you have maybe like just one year, one year of experience, if your decision or mission is to relocate to the UK and get a job in the UK, does that mean that, or oh, I'm not I'm not saying this that like, okay, this is what you have to do. I think regardless of what you have been offered, right? Probably like a more senior role, a more junior role. Um, I think you should go for it, right? I mean, Precious was able to switch. I mean, after one year, you get to another company and then with a sponsorship. So I think maybe if, you're, if you think, okay, I want to kind of maybe start a role in the UK, regardless, if you get an offer, okay, say yes to it, and then there might be an avenue for you to maybe switch within the UK. I mean, 
you can you have your hand raised? I'm just trying to, you know, um, summarize at this point. Yeah, I was just going to say, I had a caveat there that um, it's very important for when you're looking to transition to a different country to understand the translation of your skill set to what your skill set has been weighed up with in the country that you're going to because um saying that oh you're transitioning from a, a, a lower level role but you're trying to transition to a senior role is all good and fine but if the translation doesn't match or you're biting more than you can chew you would have a problem when it comes to proving your skill sets when you get into the job so it's just very important to do one's research see from linkedin as well other people who are working in the space your translatable skill sets and i think a couple of people have mentioned like Yes, is not necessarily what is a measurement, a measurement of what you've done really. Sometimes the number of years does count in the sense that you've done stuff longer. And I'm not talking about in a specific industry or whatever, but there's just something about sometimes years count for experience. However, it then also determines or depends on what kind of role are you really going for and what they're looking for. So yeah, I just wanted to add that as a caveat of, you know, it's not seen trans moving from one country to another as oh it's time for me to get that times three level rule when really career level wise you're not there yet yeah back to you helen yeah um thank you before that okay um i think I, I agree with what you said so another question and i think that would be to yeah, let me go with olawale first so Olawale, you, I mean, like you said, because you don't have a UK experience, that sort of maybe made your rejection email, maybe you have a lot of rejection email, but when you kind of intend with Cyblack, for instance, and then you start getting like, you know, call back from recruiters because there are some sort of UK experience on your role. So the interview process itself, how, I mean, what are the typical interview questions you think they kind of ask you? And how were you able to, you know, tackle those questions? There is God factor, yeah. And I think precious to you, you might want to add to this, we might want to add to this because you've, you've had to switch role within the UK. So what are the likely interview questions and how were you able to kind of tackle this? Because I think for Lawale, you know, you only had like an internship experience and then you're able to kind of get a job um can you maybe i'm not sure if you still remember some of those things i mean can you just share with us um, this evening okay maybe i'll okay, okay. Yeah, sorry. thank you yeah. okay <laughs> um so i don't know because the interview process i'm, I'm trying to remember the the things I, the questions I, I was asked during my interview, because it was just typically more like a conversation for me. Um, I don't know. I don't think there was any question that was asked that took me off balance and I wasn't able to answer. But, but to be honest, I'm trying to remember the specific questions. I know there was a particular question that I was asked about um, if if I had um, done anything, um, if I've been involved in an incident response, um, like an incident response um, event before. And what came to my mind was when I was working with um, a, a former uh, police work where uh, we had a ransomware attack. And that was like what I would use to answer that question. And um, basically, you know, it's all about knowing what the, you know, incident response plan itself, you know, the, um, the NIST um, framework for incident response and all that. You know, I was able to kind of explain a lot of those things to them and say, okay, this was actually what we did from the beginning of the incident. We, you know, make sure that um, we communicate to the social people that need to know that there's currently an incident you know, in the organization, and then work our way through, you know, remediating, um, remediation of the incident, uh, of the cyber security, um, I mean, sorry, the ransomware attack, and, you know, up to when we're able to um, um, recover 
you know, the whole um, process, the ICE process that was affected by that particular attack, you know. And I feel, um, speaking from a practical point of view, uh, um, send a message to them that, okay, this guy actually know what he's doing, or probably um, he has a good experience on, on this thing. So, I don't know, there are a couple of other questions that I was asked, maybe technical questions and, um, and non-technical questions as well. But I'm just trying, I'm just, I'm just trying to remember <laughs> the particular questions. But, but basically, it was just about, um, it was just about being real, being, um, being as, uh, how do I say it now, being, just making sure you're as real as possible. So I wasn't trying to make up anything. I was just telling them exactly what my experience has been and what I've done over time. And, you know, I could see that they were convinced that, okay, this guy actually know what he's doing. That was just what it is basically. And because I did the internship at Sidemark, that literally helped me to nail the interviews. I, I mean, I can say for a fact that my experience at um, the cyberlock internship, you know, because we did security operations on the internship, we did cloud security, we did threat intelligence, you know, all of those things helped me to be able to speak to interviewers like this is something I've been doing for a long time. So, I mean, it was <laughs> it was so priceless actually. So that's just that's just what it is for me. That was it. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And how did you get to Cyberlock? I think I think maybe I'm trying to ask ask, I mean, say the mind of people. Do you think Cyberlock is open for Nigerians? I mean, people who are currently in Nigeria in cybersecurity, do you think they can also also kind of maybe get into Cyberlock? Maybe like internship opportunity in Cyberlock or what do you think? Um during my part, I remember that a large chunk of my team members were in Nigeria. Actually, we only had two people that were, were currently were, that were currently in the UK. All of the other people, I had nine people in my group, and all of the people are all in Nigeria. They were all in Nigeria. We only had one Ghanaian guy. Okay, two people in Ghana. Actually, so every other person was in Nigeria. So I think it's it's quite easy, and I. I um, was trying to confirm from some of the guys that, okay, so come. For me, that I'm in the UK, I know we have a cyber community for students in the UK. So that was quite easy for me to join because I'm in the UK and I'm a student in the UK. But for people in Nigeria who, who um, don't have the chance to join that particular group or that particular um, um, cyber com community for students in the UK, I think that all that avenues to also be able to get the access, which is, I think, maybe um, post the cyber, cyber like posts on Twitter and also on LinkedIn. Um, um, I know that there were, there were um, several posts recently about the, the, the oncoming, um, the, next, the next cohort, because there's, there's a cohort that just, that's just ending. I, I think they probably ended now or I think they just finished now, right? So there, there have been several posts on Twitter and on LinkedIn to, you know, to um, advertise or to announce people who may be uh, possibly interested in the next cohort. So I think people should just watch out. So it's it's possible if you're in Nigeria, you can easily get onboarded on the Cyberlock internship. I think what you just what you just need to do is to follow um, Cyberlock on um on twitter also follow on linkedin as well and just watch out for um different um different posts from them actually that's it basically yeah um, thank you thank you so but precious i mean i think Prius and Ebon, you are in the cyber risk um space um what are they i won't say could them not let me put it like a interview question that they ask you but what should a cyber, a cyber risk manager expect in a cyber risk interview, for instance? 
So now I get like um, an interview call and um, I applied for a cyber risk analyst or GRC analyst or a GRC manager. What do you think would count for a success in this interview for, I mean, for you, Ebun Precious? Okay, so um, if I'll just go first, I think the first thing is a good understanding of the sector that you're interviewing for, the company that you're interviewing for, what exactly um, do they do? If So say, for example, it's not a company within consulting, it's a company in industry. Um, what sector is that company located in? Is it in the financial services? What are the key risks? So again, I'm talking about risk because you're asking specifically for cyber risk questions. So um, what are the risks that are facing organizations within that particular sector? Um, so if I, I would use a bank, for example, the top banks in the UK, for example, what kind of risks are they exposed to? What are the key cybersecurity threats? What are the emerging trends? What are you seeing? So I think it's just spending time to understand so that when, again, a lot of the questions that would come would be based on what they have put in the job description um, of that um, role that has been advertised. So again, goes back to the point of, or the need to always ensure that as much as possible, we're deepening our skills and we're acquiring the right level of skill sets for where we're going before applying to roles. So um, a good understanding of cybersecurity trends, the risk, um, what are the mitigating factors, um, things around um, regulations as well. So um, within the UK, for example, I know that the UK, a lot of companies are really big on NIST framework. So a good understanding of what the NIST framework is talking about. Yeah, a little bit around ISO 27001 and 22301, which is around business continuity. I know all of these things they are very related. So you're talking about um, sector, the financial services, for example, you're thinking about um, PCI DSS for card management. You're thinking about um, the DORA framework. I know that's something that I think is quite new within the UK, but it's something that organizations are required to comply with within the financial services um, sector as well. So um, again, if it's within the retail sector, what are the key regulate, regulations, if at all they have any, um, that they need to pay attention to from a cybersecurity point of view? It is your understanding of some of those things because I think some of the questions can be technical and it'll be technical in the sense that if you're coming in as someone who is supposed to manage or handle cybersecurity, you need to have an understanding of what's happening within their direct um, environment as well as within the sector that they found themselves in. Um, you might be in a situation where you have to comply with what their regulators are saying. So how exactly are you well positioned to do that? Then moving away from the very technical um, point of view, especially if it's a mid-level role, so it's not an entry-level role now, um, you need to also be able to demonstrate how well you're able to work in a team and manage a team. So it's beyond, I can do X, Y, Z. You then have two, three people, five people, 10 people under you. How are you able to bring those 10 people together to work effectively to achieve whatever KPIs or whatever goals. So again, it goes back to, have you worked in a team? How, it might be as little as you supervising an intern. That's you, you're able to then use those examples to demonstrate that you're able to manage uh, maybe two people, three people, whatever the case may be. So beyond all of the technical and all the, I can do this, I can do that, I'm result oriented, blah, blah, blah. How are you able to manage a team? How are you able to work within, even if it's not a management role? So have you led a team before? Um, what were the key things that um, you achieved? What were the results that um, you were able to achieve from um, that particular role or from that particular team um, that you manage? I think those would be some of the key things I would say look out for, a good understanding of the environment, a good understanding of the role that you're going to play within that environment. And then the wider industry where the organization is found in, what are the external factors? What are the frameworks? What are the regulations that they should be complying with? What are the cybersecurity trends within that sector? Because best believe that um, everybody will want to focus on things that are directly related to them. Right, so just that um, 
spending time doing research around some of those key things um would be very helpful oh thank you um Maybe I should just ask another question because of our time. I think Precious has kind of made justice to that very honest in the cyber risk aspects. And then in the technical aspects, the security operational aspects, um, all our has kind of made justice to that. Um, Ebon, you know, as an immigrant, you know, working in, in, in the UK sector, I mean, what are the obstacles you face? I mean, did you face any obstacles? I mean, and if yes, what are the obstacles you face, you know, starting your your first role in cyber security probably when you were in consulting or when you moved to your recent to your recent company and how did you kind of overcome this so because now i've interviewed i've gotten the offer and boom i'm, I'm a cyber security engineer with a uk company and i'm a nigerian with nigerian with nigeria asset and possibly i have nigeria but um, I mean, I've worked all my life in Nigeria, no UK experience whatsoever. I mean, what are the obstacles you kind of face, you know, for someone like that, from someone like you know, what I just described and how did you overcome it? Okay, so I think obstacles wise or, or challenges was when I first started my first full time role in the UK, it was getting used to the fact that, all oh, right, um, I'm entering into rooms and you're likely going to be either one of the few black people in the rooms. Um, getting used to that, I'm totally used to that now, in fact, because I'm in spaces where I'm the only one and it's fine. <laughs> but it was first that initial, okay, taking a step back, do I need to be conscious, da, da, da. But as time went on, and this is where thriving in community is so valuable because going through that i could speak to colleagues um well not colleagues in, in in the company but like other people who were already working in the uk in other spaces who took me through that journey you know and explained that you know you, first of all you're talking about you are in the uk there are more british people than black people so what do you expect the room is not going to be full of you know people of the same ethnicity as you right but taking that aside and not letting that um make you shake or falter in terms of your delivery in those rooms you're in that space because you're credible you're in that space because your skill sets were seen fit as making you being in that space so you know act like it and deliver value um and once i got the understanding of that more and more feeling that sort of way reduced and i started focusing my attention more on what i need to, what i needed to deliver um in terms of accent i did not initially i would say because going through the master's phase right i think i'd already gone through that whole accent and by the time i was coming into the workplace i'd gotten past that but i would say initially going me through the master's phase was oh your accent and people ask you oh your english is very neat oh do you speak english in Nigeria? of course yes we do but i just answered those questions and kept it moving i think for me i just decided to be focused on what i'm there to deliver and not focus on the minor things also whether your accent is nigerian whatever the accent is i mean you're in a workspace where if you if you work in a diverse space, you would have people from different ethnicities who would speak how you know their ethnicity. Is. So there is no need to feel like oh your Nigerian accent is limiting you in any way. It's not because if you could speak in an interview and you could be employed for the job, they don't care about your accent. Simple as ABC. So question and accent answered. Um, the next thing was just getting to understand in terms of coming from Nigeria. You know this is is that. Um, thing of you're used to working with people who look like you talk like you speak like you how you your lingo everything else and i'm still you know in that phase of getting adjusted to you know uk small talk um you know building relationships with colleagues so important and everything else i'm still in that phase of you know adjusting to that but i'll say that's very important as well because relationships um help you to deliver your work faster most of the times as well getting to understand people as well beyond work so i know in nigeria right we finish well i didn't have my full time only uk was not cyber security specific so other people might have other experiences maybe precious and allow a little because you can speak into it but it was different here knowing oh after work when i'm done by 5 p.m or 6 p.m sometimes i just want to go home and rest but then there's a social to go to the pub and everything that was quite different for me initially and two angles to it first i felt oh i didn't want to say no because how would i 
you know, would I be seen differently? So I would go. And then some other instances, you know, there's also the fear of missing out on what's going on. But what I would advise people is, do you, in situations where you can go for such social events, it's quite good to go and to get to speak to your colleagues more. However, I don't feel compelled or pressured to go for such events because it's not a must. It's all about also if your company is a company where they want people to bring their authentic self to work, they would always think about timing and everything else you know you could choose to go for one and not choose to go for the other one but it's just all about you and also one thing to say is I know some people as well they say oh you know people asking you I just wanted to touch about this as well don't feel weird if you go for an event and maybe you don't drink or anything else you know just share that you don't and keep it moving and speak about other things like your uniqueness should not make you feel in some sort of way like you're in the wrong space because you're not we're all individual human beings who come with diverse experiences and it's with speaking to other people as well you get to understand a bit more about the British culture what drives you know the economy and everything else um i would say so that's the last no, that's the third bit the other bit with um i will not say challenge but getting used to is understanding like i can't stress it enough what drives the business and that's the different factor in when you're going into leadership and management as well because it goes beyond now your technical skill set of an ability to adjust penetration testing all those things fitting down to certification that's all good and fine but at the next level because that's why you see as well um in terms of you know senior roles you see senior roles that someone who's come from you know being a managing director in some space in finance or whatever is brought in to be a head of something in one role inside by your thinking or their background or past experience is not inside by yeah, because that's not what's required for the role. In leadership roles, there's a lot more calling to leading people, managing teams, understanding business, speaking to different people in various areas of the business. So this is just all to say, you know, working in cybersecurity as well, as you go higher, goes beyond just your technical skill set. And also, this is also an appealing thing for people who have worked in various backgrounds prior to cyber you're looking to transition into the field your non-technical skill sets are so translatable and transferable in fact it's very appealing to employers because they understand that those things like you can't give somebody a certification to learn how to communicate with stakeholders about some a risk in advance do you get what i mean but you can teach people how to understand about confidentiality integrity availability and and all of that so your transferable skills are so appealing and is a reason why you know you should possibly you know push through and consider transitioning doing an internship you know in some community that offers that because they would then teach you that technical add-on that's it from me yeah Thank you, Abu. I mean, I agreed with what, with, with what you said about, you know, transferable skills. Um, I remembered when I got my first job, I was a graduate security engineer, but, you know, in Nigeria, you do so many things. And I was also like a knock, should I play a customer, is it customer agent or customer service? I kind of know, receive calls at the network operations center because we kind of offer, we offer like internet services to bank and so whenever there is whenever a node is done or something you need to kind of manage clients like oh sorry this is done right now and then it's like reading the scripts you know those kind of things you never knew that that could also help you along the line you know right now i'm into security operations maybe there's an incident response how do you kind of you know um um communicate with this, the incident response team you know those kind of things have, have like long way to go to be very honest and yeah i agreed with that and i think sorry if you have question you can drop it on the chat and i just want to kind of ask this one last question and possibly uh, um, bukola would go for so maybe bukola will just answer the question bukola have you i mean how have you dealt with or overcome an imposter syndrome or same doubts as your career progress in the UK. So I know that you work with um, a banking industry, I mean, you work in the banking industry in Nigeria, the consulting firm in Nigeria, now a consulting firm in the UK. I mean, have you had any point like have, have like self doubts? I mean, as as you progress in your career, like imagine working with worst clients, and um, how how did you I mean overcome that? Or maybe you were just okay, like oh, there is no imposter syndrome and the likes here. Hmm. There is a <laughs> so it's my eighth month now also. So I would say the 
first three months um, was really challenging for me. Um, I think it's just a normal thing when you like start a new firm because you need to learn a lot of things, their approaches, their templates, the kind of tools they use and everything. So coming from Deloitte to PwC, yeah, it's, it's, uh, we actually do the same thing, but there are a lot of things that I need to like how to learn and like unlearn from Deloitte and like learn year on how they do things, right? So they even have a baby year, like they call it baby, it's a tool, all tricks, we use it for data analytics, like how to learn that tool within, within two weeks of joining because there is nothing I can do without it. So there was a time when I just, when the, the first engagement that I joined, there was, like, I was like, is it that I didn't know anything again or what's really going on? Because it's, it's actually, like, I won't say it's off because I know the approach, but the, the way they are actually doing it here is actually, like, a, um, not, like, something, it's actually new to me. Yeah, that's what I would say. So um, one thing that made me, like, adapt to that is, like, I just need to like take my time to understand them, understand the team, know what they prioritize, know their working style, know how they communicate, know how they do it. So with that, nothing was really change, um, strange. And I think um, this is my eighth month and I think everything is, it's really like good now. So, but at first it was actually strange because there are a lot of things that I need to learn and yeah. So there was a, a time I had to tell my other that it's like, I think I'm the only one they were giving this complex control so because <laughs> yeah, it was that it was that difficult that I had to like stretch myself to learn a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th thank you for that. To be very honest, I think cyber security, in cyber security, you never stop learning, right? Um, you're always like, oh, I don't know anything maybe today you feel like oh now i understand what the concepts and tomorrow it's a new world like oh god i need to understand another concept and yeah um Nicola, you're right and i i remembered when i joined okay it was mostly fully remote and then during meetings to be very honest i don't switch on my cameras i'm always muted and then i will switch off my camera and at the end of 30 minutes or one hour session, the only thing you will hear me saying is, hi, which is the beginning of the meeting. And at the end of the meeting, we're like, chess, <laughs> you know? And I think for like one month, two months, I was like that because I was like, oh God, how, how do I cope? And as I progress, I remember, okay, now I will turn on my camera. Okay, let, let me kind of improve on that. And I turn on my camera. I'll be, I'll be so stationary like this. I won't want to kind of look somewhere else or maybe take a coffee or something. And you see others you know, taking coffee while all those kind of things. But, you know, I think it gets better, to be very honest. I think I was really scared the first three months. I was like, how do I even talk, you know? But like Evan said, you... They won't have even they won't have even given you the offer if you don't have the experience or the necessary skills to kind of get your work done. I think my focus is give me one thing and I will do it right, and that's all. I don't want to contribute, you know. But I think that is a good thing to be very honest. I mean, if I was kind of you know go back in three years time, I mean, I would have done it better. Yeah. So please learn from me. Don't switch off your camera for one hour. <laughs> I think I, I was actually like in your shoes at some point. <laughs> And one of the things I learned here also is that um, they said um, your work would not really speak for you as at back home, that you need to prove that you are really working. But I think I'm I'm still learning that because back home, once they give me something to do, don't worry, I will do it. Just leave me. I will do yeah. it. And when you go to like um, the tax that I was giving, you can see that okay, I've actually done a good job. But this, I think I need to prove that I'm actually doing the good job. I don't know. It's actually strange to me, yeah, but I think it's it's what it is. And <laughs> I need to like make myself more visible to them. And yeah, thank yeah. you. 
Um, Ebon, you have something to say before we go to the questions here? Yeah? yeah, I was just going to say when she talked about being visible, it's so important, right? It's not only visibility with camera, but visibility with your metrics. Don't be don't be shy to share about your metrics for delivery. Um, one thing you notice, like sometimes, you know, it's about working smart as well. While you work hard, work smart to, you know, put the metrics of what you've delivered for the week. Always document, share at the end of, you know, progressively in time for your, you know, performance reviews and whatever. Don't let it be at the final point. You're now writing everything down. Let there be a progression of all of your achievements from time to time. And you may think, oh, you talked about it yesterday. You will be surprised. You'll be on calls of people saying something they said last week 10 times. And they're saying it again. You're thinking we've heard. But they know what they do by saying it 10 times again. So you two shout about your achievements every time, every time. Don't stop talking about it. Because really, that's how people go on to spread the word about your delivery and the great work you're doing, even in rooms that you're not in. So yeah, I just wanted to add that. I mean, I, I agree, Ebon, 100%. I mean, I think I remember one of the organizations I work with in Nigeria. Performance review is not based on what you've done. It's mostly based on your manager's discretion. Yeah, I mean, they just give you 70 or 80 or 60 or 50. I think, like, oh, I have a C, I have a D, I have a B. And it's not mostly based on, oh, I've done A, B, C, D. It's very honest. But I think here, yeah, you have to be more intentional about your deliverable. Yes, I've done this. Like you said, some people in stand-ups, like start of like a maybe weekly meeting or daily meeting, they can repeat the same thing all over and over and over again for like one month. And you feel like, oh, I've said this yesterday and I can't repeat it again. But yeah, I mean, you're right about that. And thank you everyone for, for um, I mean, um, telling us that. So question from Francis, and I don't know who's going to ask this question, I don't know. Could you please share the CV templates that landed you offers in the UK? Is, is Do you think like it, UK has like a specific CV template or what do you guys have to say about that? Okay, so maybe Francis, you can reach out to any one of us on LinkedIn and then we may be able to share our CV with you um, in, um, personally on LinkedIn, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, Olawale. Yeah, I wanted to say Olawale should speak into that. <laughs> okay, Olawale, please speak into that. Okay, so um, concerning CV templates, I Actually, I would not say that there's a particular CV template. So I remember that before I before I came into before I came into the UK on on student visa, I got I actually got a job from Nigeria for an, for a network analyst role in in one of the companies in the UK. The reason why I didn't get the job, or the reason why, in fact, it was actually a sponsorship job. They already said who they were going to sponsor. And the reason why I didn't get the job was because when they went, um, when they they, um, they they said they needed to do some processing in the home office and then come back to me. And then they said, when they came back, they now said that, okay, they are sorry, they can't go on with the job because um, I need the home office that classified the job as a job that requires security clearance. Okay, so that was the reason why I was not able to get that job. I would have been in the UK on work visa instead of the student visa. So now, but before then, I had spoken with someone in the UK to help me. Um, I sent my CV over to him to help me try and remove all my CV based on the UK standard, right? So maybe I could get a job. I remember then I didn't get a response from him. He wasn't, I, I guess he was busy and all that. He wasn't able to do that for me. But interestingly, the same CV that I thought would not get me a job in the UK was the same one that actually got me that job, yeah, even though I didn't get the job eventually. But actually, I got the job. It's not like I wasn't qualified for the job. It was just because I don't have security grants. And security grants, you have to be in the UK for, you have to have been in the UK for five years for you to have security grants. So, yeah. The fact that I was even in Nigeria, there's no way I can qualify for, for having a security guard. So, so now my point actually is that I do not think that there's a particular format that you have to use in the UK. But the only thing is just make sure that you don't put unimportant things on your CV. Make sure that your CV is straight to the point, your experience, your, your background, 
um, 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 what your uh, responsibilities have been on different jobs you have done in relation to what the employer is actually asking for or in relation to the job description of the job that you're applying for. I mean, that's it for me, basically. And the same CV I've been using in Nigeria, the same template I have since I've been in Nigeria, it's the same one I'm still using, even though I've tried to embellish one or two things here and there. But I mean, it's still the same CV that has gotten me this job. I've not received or I've not collected one in quotes, CM, UK CV template from someone and now remodel that for my own uh, job application. Do you understand? So I think basically it's just about making sure your CV is is fantastic, is straight to the point, um, um, your 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 job role and everything. I mean, your your job experience is has a caption so that they can see immediately what you have done, and that's it basically. Uh, I'm not sure there is. Yeah. Yeah. There is a yeah. To use. Yes, very honest. I I agree with all of it. Yeah, I think when I got my first job yeah, in the UK, I think I used my Nigeria CV as well. I mean, and, and I think I've mentioned this earlier, like remove the necessary details, your date of birth, your full address and the likes. And yeah, there is no UK related CV, UK template, templated CV to be very honest, yeah. And last question, I mean, so sorry, this is six minutes from, I mean, like six minutes I um more than time. So, but now, last question is how would one go about the right right to work in the uk question that is usually asked at the point of application like i know that some organization would ask like if do you have the right to work in the uk and then you say no or yes right how would you go about it and this is a question from tofumi um bukola ebum okay i think ebum or lawale how did you go about that like do you have the right to work in the UK? Uh, let me even say precious. Precious or um, yeah. Okay. Um, if I'll just quickly take um this one. I think it's I think it's a very straightforward um answer to be honest. Do you have the right to work in the UK? Um it depends on where you are. So if you're applying from outside the uk the answer is no right um you currently don't have the right to work in the uk and that's where that conversation around are they able to provide sponsorship and all of that um will come in if you're applying from inside of the uk again it also depends on what visa you're currently on and all of that but i think the simple answer would be um that you currently do not have the right to work in the uk and you would require sponsorship i think um some applications will ask you to explain what the exact situation is and all of that so again it's also for you to then cross check and be sure that oh are they able to sponsor using that list that i think was Ebon who mentioned it so i think on gov.uk that's the uk government website there's a list of companies um that have the license to sponsor so it's always um relevant to double check before you apply so that you're also not just wasting your time again there's also this the angle of you can just apply and see if or oh, they think you're really good and all of that and they're willing to go through the entire process with you but um my own suggestion would be to state it as it is have a conversation with them and say you're um you would require sponsorship to be able to take, to take on the job and all of that and then yeah see how it goes from there yeah thank you precious it's just a simple answer no right and then yeah they might call back and they may not call back i mean some people will still call you back regardless of your of your answer even if you say no and if the company can if the company has a license to sponsor and depending on you know, your experience they might just want to talk to you and you know hear you out so um i think we are nine minutes out of time i would just like to say thank you everyone uh, i assume there is no any other question but thank you everyone for joining this call. I mean, th this webinar. Um, um, thank you, Abulua. Thank you, Bukola. Thank you, Lawali. Thank you, Freshers, for saying yes to to this um, this evening. And um, I think that's all we can actually call it. A, call it an evening. Uh, please have a wonderful weekend and a great you know, Christmas celebration. 
and I hope um, one of your 2024 goals would be like, oh, I want to kind of secure a role in the UK. And if you have any other question, please, you can reach out to any one of us on LinkedIn and then we can take it up from there. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, thank you for joining. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.